All right. Uh, our next speaker is Steve Watt, and he's going to talk about taking guesswork out of your Hadoop infrastructure. Steve. OK. Hi, folks. Steve Watt. Um, I'm going to be presenting on taking the guesswork out of your Hadoop infrastructure. So uh, just to sort of level set, um, up until December last year, I had spent the last two years at HP as the chief technologist for the Hadoop program. So um, a lot of the findings are from that, and HP has graciously allowed me to represent our, our work. So, but I do currently work at Red Hat at the moment. So my agenda for this talk is to clear up um, some pretty persistent uh, misconceptions about Hadoop infrastructure. And part of this is around the fact that um, there's a lot of collateral on the web that's sort of left over from 2006 around Hadoop uh, guidelines and best practices. And so, you know, I've sort of highlighted it around here, but, you know, the, the recommendations that you sort of see on this blog are sort of 2006-like, you, you know, given the current processors and a balanced node, you'd probably want something like four disks or something, but in today's day with the economy, uh, sorry, commodity architectures, you'd probably want something that's more like 12 disks, right? So this is actually completely incorrect right now. And so part of the reason that we have that is the web scale origins for Hadoop are around single or dual socket, one plus gigahertz, so somewhere around 1.2 gigahertz to 1.8. Uh, 4 to 8 giga RAM, often 32-bit, moving later to 64-bit, and uh, with 2 to 4 cores and a single 1 gigabit NIC, right, which is a bad thing, right? If you lose your NIC, your whole node goes offline. Um, and then 2 to 4 1 terabyte SATA drives. Whereas today, um, you're looking, the majority of Hadoop deployments are dual socket, 2 plus gigahertz, so I commonly see between 2.4 to 2.9 gigahertz, um, 24 to 48 gig of RAM, four to six cores, um, two to four uh, one gig NICs. Um, you know, just as a, a case in point, like HP's class of servers that they sell for Hadoop don't come with a two gigabit, just a two gig um, NIC option. You know, most uh, enterprise class servers these days have uh, a flexible LAN on motherboard type, you know, regardless of vendor where you either get four one giggy or two 10 giggy. Just that, right? So you, you can't really get a two one giggy at the moment. So, and then typically, you know, if you're looking at a one U server, you might have four disks, but uh, you know, you'd probably be going that route because you're having rack density issues or something to that effect. Really, it's a two U server with 14 large form factor SATA drives, and so. So it's sort of completely different, right, to the other one. And there's, there's other issues why the enterprise is quite different to the web, web scale, right? So by that, I mean like the Yahoo's, the LinkedIn's, the Facebook's, the eBay's, um, in that, you know, they're running thousands of nodes, right, um, or hundreds of nodes, and economies of scale are quite different. So in the enterprise, they're typically on average running one to two racks. And if you're running one to two racks in production with a service level agreement around uptime, the, um, it's quite a big deal if you lose three nodes, right? So typical rack, you'll have 20 nodes per rack, right? So you've got your total cluster is 40, 40 nodes, right? So if two, two to four nodes go offline, it's kind of a big deal. And so what you'll see, different behavior in the enterprise, right? You'll often hear people say, no raid in Hadoop worker nodes, right? So it's Hadoop slaves, right? Don't, don't use RAID at all. Well, actually, if you have 14 drives, it kind of makes a lot of sense to put your OS and Hadoop runtime on one of the drives and do a RAID mirror of that so to avoid the case of if you lose that one drive, the whole node goes offline, right? And so you do a RAID one mirror of those, and then you still have 12 disks left over, you know, 24 terabytes to do, you know, to sit as data disks, right, for your data node or uh, your task track or temp info. So, there's a bit of a, you, you really have to factor scale in here. So there are really three things to get right with, um, with Hadoop, right? You've got to balance storage capacity, specifically the requirements of the Hadoop distributed file system with the performance of the computational layers that sit on top of it. So, um, and then at the same point, you want to get them at a price that you find palatable, right? So enterprises typically want to spend well, my recommendation is not to really spend more than, or well, get as close to $10,000 per node as possible, right? Um, if you want a more performant architecture, that's going to start edging up towards $20,000, right? And it adds up fairly quickly. So there's, 
you know, it's tricky to balance. And so what I'm going to do is show you a method to um, be able to instrument your workload and be able to completely optimize your, your infrastructure and pick the exact things that you should buy to be able to get the best bang for your buck. So the first thing, obviously, is to understand your workload, right? So what, you know, if you're doing MapReduce ETL ingest or you're doing k-means clustering or some sort of page rank graph processing algorithm, um, you've got to know whether your workload is I.O. bound or CPU bound, et cetera. And keep in mind that's a, uh, a mixture of your application design with the infrastructure that it's running on. If you remember the keynote the other day, um, the, guy said, the guy gave a, an example of um, someone saying, hey, I'm I.O. bound. And he said, well, tell me about your server, right? The whole point of understanding right up and down the sack, stack. And the guy's like, well, for an I.O. intensive workload with, uh, you know, dual socket, lots of cores, but I have two disks, right? Well, duh, you're, you know, buy more disks, right? You know, spread the I.O.s out. So um, you've got to know whether you're I.O. bound, CPU bound. The problem is, Almost when I was at HP, almost all our customers I spoke to, nobody's, nobody's done this, right? It's very uncommon to find somebody that actually understands the characteristics of their workload on their hardware. In fact, the only person I know is uh, the LinkedIn ops, Alan Wittenauer. So here's, here's a, a, a method to do that, right? It's very simple. It's actually common sense. You instrument the cluster, then you run your workload, and then you analyze the numbers. Now, it's a common... Um, misstep to do a paper exercise for Hadoop, uh, which is, you know, theoretically, you know, with this disk to core ratio and, you know, what we know about our I.O. profile on a single node, that it should be behave like this. Don't. Just don't. It's every single time we uh, posited an outcome on paper at HP, we were wrong, right? Hadoop <laughs> proved us wrong every single time. So, so what you're seeing here in this picture is uh, Andy Lerner, who's a member of our team. And you're seeing a a, a map R cluster on the rack on the right and Cloudera on the left. Um, so let me just sort of explain and I'm going to just point out. Um, so if the way uh, racks are set up, right, so not all of us spend a lot of time around racks. I'm just going to, for those that don't know, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, overview. A typical enterprise class rack is 42U, right, and that's a, a, it's a height measurement, right. And um, a U is, is basically roughly this big, right? It's, it's about this high. It's probably about two inches. And uh, that is a unit of measurement. And so there's 42 of those U's that fill up a rack. And servers that slide into a rack are usually one U or two U or four U, right? You can get more, I guess, bigger, more dense ones. But what you'll see typically for Hadoop is a one U or a two U, which basically is something, a server this thick or a server that thick, right? And they, they slide in like a tray, right? So, um, so, so what we did here is anytime um, we did a reference architecture for a partner on our, on our platforms, we had to figure out what was the right um, server guidelines or recommendations that we would make for their software. And this is actually standard for this business unit. So whether they're doing, you know, SAP or SAS analytics, they go through the same process. And so they run a bunch of workloads and then they look and understand the constraints and then they, you know, add a controller or add a couple of disks or, you know, improve the processors, more cores, et cetera, et cetera. So they go through this process. So the process that we used, um, just to, to get an understanding, is that we did a 10 terabyte terasort. This is sort of a funny segue to me because um, this is very convenient. There's a flash drive right here. Um, you know, the majority of customers are uh, doing, at least using a couple of terabytes for, for Hadoop. They might not, it's not necessarily everyone's in the petabyte age, right? But they're, they're doing a couple of terabytes. If you see somebody that tells you that they've done a 100 gigabyte benchmark for Hadoop, you, say, you should say, you see this? That's 100 gigabytes. It's on a flash drive. It's nonsense, right? So you want to do you know, at least 10 terabytes with something if you're going to properly exercise your rack. So, um, so what we've got here is we've got a dedicated job tracker and a dedicated name node. Um, that's pretty much standard practice for full deployment. And then we've got 18 Hadoop slaves, so 18 Hadoop nodes and um, just to make sure you understand, the, the 360, which runs the job tracker and the name node, that's a 1U. And it's, a, it's exactly the same server as the other one. 
The difference is it's, um, the other ones are 2U because it's got to have space for all the drives, right? So the, the job tracker and name node don't really have, they, they need lots of uh, CPU and memory, but not disk space, right? So, so that's really what's different between them. And then for the, the Hadoop slaves, we, ha we configured Terrasort with 18 maps and 12 reducers. We played around a little bit with that to uh, improve in performance. And just uh, to give you an idea of this, we set the, the, the fastest terabyte, uh, sorry, uh, Hadoop Terrasort record with this, uh, this config. Um, okay, and so basically what you've got is 64 gig RAM, um, two point, uh, dual six core Intel 2.9 gigahertz processors, and then two, two controllers um, with uh, 16 one terabyte small form factor disks. So I'm gonna stop here and sort of explain why we went with that route, right? 64 gig of RAM is, could be a little bit over-provisioning the memory for typical Hadoop uses, but when you, when you set up a system like this, you wanna sort of over-provision and then tune down, right? So remove a controller or remove some disk. So we specifically over-provisioned a little bit. But when you want a screaming fast I.O. subsystem, you've gotta look at how your controller um, connects to your drive cage and your drives. So these particular controllers have four cables coming off them. Within in each cable, there's two SAS lanes. And basically, you, that way you can have a, uh, the drive cage takes eight disks. So with four cables and two lanes, you get eight lanes per controller going to a drive cage, right? So we could fully drive eight drives without them having to share lanes and run into bandwidth issues that would later affect throughput issues, right? And so since we had two drive cages, we had 16 disks, and therefore we had two controllers so we could fully drive all 16 disks without running into, and you'll see later, we had great IO performance. And then we do four bonded one gig NICs so that you have roughly four um, gigabits of um, throughput on your NICs, and we do that at uh, the, uh, configure that through Linux. Okay, so the keys to capture the data, use whatever framework that you're uh, comfortable with. Um, Paul, our performance architect, uh, uh, was most familiar with the Linux SAR tool. Ganglia is another uh, popular option. But um, I'll sort of walk through quickly what, the way we captured this, right? So you have um, an outer script, and it shells into every node in the Hadoop cluster and starts the Linux SAR tool, and it starts capturing metrics. The outer script, once it's done that, goes and then submits the Terrasort job. Terrasort then runs to completion, and then, the SAR, uh, then it shells back into the nodes, it stops SAR, and then basically it takes the .dat files that SAR generates and it converts them to CSV. We load that into MySQL, and then we do ad hoc analytics on this, and then we use Excel to, from MySQL to generate our charts, right? And that looks just like that, right? So that's in a sort of an example of us piping out. You can sort of see the top right, I have the CPU utilization information, then the I.O. rate, and then the network devices, right? So once this is piped out into MySQL, we can really do ad hoc analytics. So if we need to dive down into one particular node, we can just do it through SQL and sort of see what was going on if there were any anom anomalies. So now let's look at the data. So um, the first thing, you know, really what you want to achieve is you want to get the CPU as busy as possible without the CPU waiting on any sort of I.O. subsystem, whether it's the disk subsystem or the network devices, right? And so you want to make sure that you're not I.O. bound or network bound and that you can keep your CPU busy and doing as much work for you as possible, right? That'll improve your time to completion. So the first thing is you want to get a sort of a baseline of... Um, how good your I.O. subsystem performs outside of Hadoop, right? Which is you run the DD test. If you're curious about this, just Google it. Do, you know, DD test I.O. throughput, and there's lots of great blog posts that explain how to do this. But this will basically give you a, a, an idea of your throughput of your I.O. subsystem, right? And so usually what you can expect is it's 100 megabytes a second per disk. And so depending on uh, how many disks you have, you have an aggregate. So uh, it's 1.6 gigabytes a second of read throughput. So now I'm gonna explain the chart on the x-axis, it's uh, time, right, progression of time, and on the y-axis, it's uh, megabytes a second. So now we can go to 1.6 gigabytes a second, so the chart really is sort of chopped off halfway in the middle, right? So we're really just getting 10% total throughput utilization, and we're not 
troubling our IO subsystem whatsoever, right? So we've actually over-provisioned the IO subsystem. We could save a lot of cost by tuning this down because we're not really using it much. The next thing to check is the network subsystem. And uh, similarly, um, we can drive four gigabits a second because the NICs are bonded, roughly thereabouts, which if you do some simple math, maps to 400 megabytes a second, right? And so that's what you're seeing on the uh, y-axis is in increments of 20, right? So again, it should go up to 400, but you know we're just gonna chop it off at 160. And on the x-axis, again, it's elapsed time. So you're seeing the net net is that uh, we're ha at a quarter of our network capacity here. And so the key thing to keep in mind is Terrasort's not a particularly network intensive workload. If uh, you change this to test DFS IO, um, which basically writes to the HDFS and it creates files and then those files are then blocks and then those blocks are replicated across nodes, you'll light up the next, right? And it'll you know, start pegging your NIC infrastructure. But if you're not network intensive, you know, you can kind of see that, like, a lot of people are saying, oh, you need to go to 10 gigi or InfiniBand for Hadoop. You can see here for a 10 terabyte terasort, we're barely, you know, scratching at the surface of what our next can do on a 1 gigi. So just keep in mind, you know, you should profile and you'll understand a bit better. So on the CPU subsystem, this is, you know, theoretically you could shortcut this all and just look at this guy. Uh, there's two metrics here, um, which is you want to keep the CPU as busy as possible, but the I.O. wait time has got to be really low, right? Which means that the CPU is not waiting on instructions from the network or disk subsystem, right? And so um, you can see here our IOs wait times near negligible, and you can most likely guess when the map fa phase ends and when the the reduce starts and the shuffle and sorts. It get, gets a little busier there, but you know it's 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 very low, right? So this is this is a good chart. This is exactly where we want to be on our CPU. Um, then the memory subsystem is an interesting anecdotal um, chart here, which is basically that we're caching a lot of um, data in memory, right? So what you're seeing here on x-axis is elapsed time, and uh, y-axis is memory utilization. And you're comparing the blue, which is the memory usage, with the red, which is the percentage cache. So there's lots of data that's being cached in memory, which means that there's a lot of memory available to cache data, and there aren't processes consuming that memory, right? So this is probably a stronger indicator. It's correlated. I wouldn't say it's causal, but um, correlated to why there's probably a, lot, a, a minimal I.O. wait time on the, this slide below, because if it needs data, it's in memory, right? Okay, so now at this point we're like, well, you know, we did a great job, pat ourselves on the back. We're, we've d designed a, a smoking fast um, Hadoop worker node, but it's an expensive one, right? Um, so if you're in this position, what are some of the types of things that, um, you know, say you're in the position where you could found that you were actually I.O. bound um, or CPU bound or something to that effect, um, what could you do to, fi to fix it? And so. This slide is sort of like the, my sort of higher level best practice slide around tuning, right? So the first thing to, to do is to talk to your data center folks. There's a really interesting stat that generally true across all data centers, which is that if your rack cost you $300,000, it's gonna cost you $100,000 in power and cooling costs per year to maintain it, right? That's pretty amazing. That When I learned that, I was sort of flabbergasted. So, it's, you know, getting a, a correct power and cooling footprint is key in a large scale out environment. And so the first thing you should do is go and talk to your data center ops folks and ask them, how much floor space do I have? And uh, typically you'd put a rack on a particular floor tile. And so if the guy says, or gal says, there's only five floor tiles available and you can only fit in five racks, um, but yet, you know, you're still constrained for a Hadoop job to complete in a particular amount of time, and so you can't scale out to improve performance and by using parallelization, you have to buy beefier nodes, right? So um, you basically have to buy more compute power and, you know, that, um, because you're constrained, you can't scale out. So that, that's key and something you don't want to find out after the fact. Um, the next thing is um, power. So that the, the data center folks can usually only power, um, provide a certain amount of power to each floor tile. And so, um, you've got to figure out how you constrain there. 
So now assuming you have enough power for your particular uh, rack architecture, um, when it's all powered up, you then have to cool that thing. So there's, there's a particular thermal footprint that they can support, and they can't, you can't exceed it, otherwise they can't cool it, and then things start catching on fire, which isn't good. So that's something else that you have to figure out. So you have to figure out power, cooling, floor space, and this dictates everything else, right? So, um, okay, so now let's talk about the IO system. So there's two sort of key um, disk types uh, for Hadoop, right? There's um, SATA, um, and there's midline SAS. So it's really 7,200 RPM versus 10,000 RPM. And uh, SATA will give you, uh, sorry, midline SAS will give you about a 40% um, boost in performance on IO workloads at about a 20% increase in price. So, you know, if you can afford midline SAS, good for you. It's, um, but if you can't, um, if you really have a huge environment, you should just go with uh, large form factor SATA. So, so those are your different types of disks. Um, the amount of disks is the next thing, right? So why did I say 12 disks versus four disks? So with the, um, you know, if you've got dual socket six cores, so you've got 12 cores, these are Intel processors, they're hyper-threaded, so you can, you know, sort of like 1.5 times the amount of cores, or up to two that you can get if you double the amount. But um, this comes down to MapReduce slots, right? So how many MapReduce slots do you want to configure? You can configure a lot. I mean, we had 30 configured on, uh, um, on this uh, particular uh, run on TerraSort. Now imagine you just had two disks, right? Those disks both have blocks uh, for a number of different file sets, right? And you could be running, depending on your scheduler, um, a number of different jobs where you have tasks on a particular node, so say you have 10 slots with a task running in each slot from a different job or running against a different block, all hitting the same disk, right? So then basically in that case, you're going to create interleaved I.O. and queuing, right, on uh, the disk access, right? So you want to be, have many disks that you can spread those requests out and reduce the likelihood of that happening. It's going to happen, but you can just reduce the amount of it happening. So that's why you want a lot of disks. Then you want, then the discussion happens on type of disk, right? So you get two and a half inch disks that the industry typically refers to as small form factor disks and three and a half inch disks that are bigger. So they cost the same, but the small form factor disks are like one terabyte and the large form factor disks are about two to three terabytes, right? So you get much more storage capacity on a large form factor disk versus a small form factor disk. So that's typically why I recommend going with a, um, a 2U server with at least 12 large form factor drives, because that way you have the drive count to improve, spread the IOs around, but you also have the storage capacity that you want in HDFS while keeping the price constant, right? So the next, ask, the next thing is number of controllers, right? So I spoke earlier about um, you want a dedicated lane to each disk, right? And so the second controller is gonna add a couple of hundred dollars, right, depending on how nice the controller is, right, and, and the types of features it provides. Um, you, uh, you can save money. I mean, if you're buying 600 servers, you know, that, add, that 500 bucks per server adds up, right? So um, you can save cost um, uh, by going with just a single controller instead of two um, with, with a small loss on uh, IO performance that you're going to run into for... IO intensive workloads because what's going to happen is you'll start sharing lanes, which means you lose a bit of bandwidth and your throughput decreases a bit. So just something to think about. But that's actually what I'd recommend is one controller with 12 disks um, for a good price point. So then the next aspect is power and compute, right? So Intel, um, and I'll go into non-Intel as well in this presentation later because there's some really exciting stuff happening um, around AMD, sorry, um, ARM, and Intel Atom, like the low power processors that have moved over from mobile devices. So there's um, the socket R processors, which are like 130 watt chips. That's the 2.9 gigahertz one that I used, but the power footprint is quite a bit higher than the socket B, which are like 95 watt. So the basic difference there is they're both six core chips. The higher, higher powered ones um, run at 2.9 gigahertz. The lower powered ones run at 2.4 gigahertz. For Hadoop at scale, for a generic architecture, I would recommend the lower power, the 95 watt. I don't think the half a gigahertz is gonna make that much of a difference. Amount of cores, four to six to eight cores, 
at a price point, at a commodity price point, I'd recommend six cores at this point in time. Um, Another thing that you need to factor in is memory channels. Different processor types have different memory channels. So the ones that, um, so the, the socket R, the 131 watt processors have four memory channels per processor, right? You have two processors, so you have eight, right? So if you're using eight gigabyte DIMMs, that'll allow you to have 64 gigabytes of RAM for that node. If you're using HBase or some sort of NoSQL solution that's really memory intensive, you might want to go with that option. Um, if you go with the socket B, they only have three channels per node. And so, you know, at eight gigabytes, um, that's uh, 48 gig of RAM, right? So you have, um, sorry, 24. Um, yeah, so, um, so you have less memory that's available to you, you know, and you just need to factor that in in the processor that you pick. Um, something that I don't think is that well known is um, there are special kinds of DIMMs. So, um, you know, people, freak out a bit about the name node limitation around, you know, each block is like 150 bytes and, um, you know, when you run out of memory, you can't, you know, you can't, you know, your, your file, your namespace is sort of frozen, right? And, uh, you know, the, these standard commodity servers can go up to almost 800 gig of RAM. So, you know, you, it's just the DIMMs are a lot more expensive, but you can do that. So if you want a super beefy name node, you're not blocked at 64. You can I think one of them goes up to 968. So that, that's just something I don't feel like the community is particularly well aware of. Okay, um, next thing is the network. Remember I mentioned about the difference between enterprise and web scale. If you talk to the Yahoo guys that ran opposite uh, Yahoo for their Hadoop cluster, they always only had one switch in their rack. But you know, in the same way that if you lose the node, if you lose a disk on a node that has your OS, that whole node goes offline. Well, imagine what happens if you've got you know, 20 nodes in a rack all connected to a single top of rack switch that's connected to your core aggregation switch and you lose that switch. The whole rack goes offline. What does Hadoop do when, the when a node goes offline? It starts rebalancing. You're gonna create a network storm that if your network isn't big enough, it will crash your Hadoop cluster, right? So what you want is if you have a small cluster, buy two switches, right? Have a redundant switch so that you're covered in that event, right? Now, the Yahoo guys will say, no, at you know, different scale dynamics, they had so many, so many nodes and so many racks that if they lost a rack, it wasn't a big deal. It was kind of like losing just one node, which is impressive. Um, I mentioned server NICs. Again, you want to have at least two, right? So that if you lose a NIC, your node doesn't go offline and you start replicating. So have at least two, but you'll find that the commodity, most of the time, they just come with four a flexible LAN on motherboard, right, has a, a network card, and that card has four NICs or two 10, four one giggy or two 10 giggy NICs. Um, so that's good because it improves your network throughput as well as gives you additional redundancy. Um, something you need to figure out. Um, you need to make sure that if you're using four ports, net, four uh, network ports on each server, uh, you have enough ports available in your switches for all of that. I mean, we were, when we um, cabled up those clusters you saw in the demo, there, were, there was like four ports left open, right? So, um, you know, if, and those were for two U servers. If you're going to one U servers, we would have run out of ports, right? So just factor that in in your design. The last thing is, I don't actually have any data points about this, so this is uh, one of those dangerous paper exercises that I mentioned, but um, the um, uh, switches with deep packet buffering. Hadoop is a bursty framework, right? It's basically, um, if you watch, watch a, a Hadoop job visualized, you'll basically see, you know, the I.O. spins up and the CPU spins up, the network stays quiet, and then it gets to the shuffle and sort, and boom, the NICs light up, right? And so um, switches with deep buffering will ensure that uh, packets don't get dropped, right? It can just buffer the packets coming in and then process them late, later with, uh, before um, the packets time out. Okay, so... However, you want to avoid introducing this new phenomenon, what I call Hadoop Ops whack-a-mole, right? Which is, I just explained how to tune a cluster for one particular workload. Well, imagine you're responsible for maintaining the Hadoop infrastructure in your large company, and you have Hadoop clusters popping up everywhere. You get this whack-a-mole ph phenomenon, right? It's much more cost-effective and efficient to basically have 
a single shared managed service, right? So you have one large cluster that you can share equitably among all the different internal customers, right? So I'm going to explain how to do this, right? Part of the multi-tenancy multi within Hadoop is really immature. Um, so I'm going to explain the infrastructure bit. There's different schedulers that you can use to do this, and you can, you know, um, ensure uh, that you can assign, you know, uh, you can constrain uses of HDFS to certain customers that you can correlate to the ones that you're scheduling jobs with right in your scheduler, but it's not that much more sophisticated. But, um, okay, so if you want to um, build a nice scale-out cluster, this is really what I recommend, right? You want for your name node and job tracker, you want a, a 1U 64 gig of RAM, two dual socket 2.9 gigahertz, six core, uh, with four small form factor disks, RAID mirrored, right? So basically, net net, this is like beefy CPU, beefy memory. It's going to do great for your job tracker. It could do great for your name node, but doesn't need a lot of disks. For your Hadoop slaves, you want uh, 48 gig of RAM. Will work well with HBase and MapReduce and Impala and you know whatever else other compute Yarn or whatever other computational frameworks start running on top of HDFS. Um, dual socket, six core. Low power, the socket B processors, so you keep your steady state uh, data center costs as low as possible. You have one high performing disk controller that I mentioned earlier, not two. 12 2 terabyte large form factor disk in JBOD configuration. Um, that gives you 24 terabytes of storage capacity per node uh, with a pretty performance setup and it's low power consumption. Now I mentioned JBOD and I, I thought I should clarify this, right? Um, typically, you know, this. These servers that you get 12 disks usually come in 14 disks as well. You'll typically have two at the back of the server that are specifically intended to mirror the OS and the other 12 to be data drives. Now, when you buy that controller, it's typically a RAID controller, right? And it can be tricky to get RAID controllers to do JBOD setup. So what you do is you set up each individual disk as its own individual RAID 0 volume. So you don't take all 12 and create one RAID 0 volume from them. You have RAID 0 volume, RAID 0 volume, RAID 0. It's effectively a JBOD. Um, you will see papers out there. There's a, a section in Tom White's book. Um, there's a recent blog post from Cloudera about RAID 0 configuration and how JBOD is faster. They are talking about taking all 12 disks and creating a single JBOD. So there's a clarification there. So you're creating a single RAID 0 volume from all 12, 12 disks. So, just to clarify, so it's not a bad thing to create individual RAID 0 volumes. Okay, so assuming that those are your two server building blocks, now let's talk about the rack building blocks. So what I'm going to propose here is, uh, is that 10 minutes until questions or 10 minutes tops? 12 minutes to the Okay, oh, okay, all right, so I'm going to finish up here real quick. Um, the, um, so if we set up, what I'm going to posit is if you set your rack up this way, that you can basically scale out until the Hadoop 1.0's current scalability limit without ever having to go back and change this configuration, right? So that's what I mean by a building block. So what you have is two redundant one gigabit switches, and those will connect to a 10 gigabit switch as a, for your uh, core aggregation uh, uh, network interconnects that connect all your racks together. Um, you have you know, a management node, um, so this, uh, the job tracker and the name node setup that I showed earlier, you have a third one that's a management node. And this node basically is multi-homed. It sits between your user network and your private network that you create for your Hadoop cluster. And that way you isolate the traffic within your Hadoop cluster from outside traffic, right? So your Hadoop cluster is in its own private network. The user network's in their own private network. How do they get and talk and move data back and forwards to Hadoop? You've got to have something that's multi-homed and sits on both networks. And that's your management node. That's where you'll stick Pig and Hive and your Hadoop clients. That's where you'll put your job tracker or your Cloudera manager or your Ambari on there, right? Sorry, not your job tracker. That's where you'll put Ambari or Cloudera manager the applications that users can see the progress of their jobs. And then basically the Hadoop slave, you just fill the rack up with the rest of those. Leaves one you open for a, a keyboard video monitor, a KVM switch, for people to sort of debug what's going on. This is the scale up now. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to add one or, so a single rack reference architecture or building block. That was the first slide. So the block on the left is what I just showed you. The block on the right is you're going to add one or more of those and just keep scaling out 
rack by rack to grow your Hadoop cluster. And so that's pretty much the same thing. Two switches, two top rack switches, and then you just fill the cluster with Hadoop slaves. And you connect that to a 10 gigabit um, uh, aggregation network at the back. And so that, and basically if you just follow this process, it's a really simple way of just designing a cluster, right? So my last slide. Um, here is something that's interesting. Hadoop has come full circle. So if you look at what I started on my first slide, which was um, the Hadoop in 2006 and the setup right now, if you look at what people are doing with ARM processors and Intel Atom and creating server cartridges for those, it sort of maps right over to the same spec. So 4 to 8 gig of RAM, 4 cores, 1.8 gigahertz, 2 to 4 terabytes in a single NIC. So I'm going to wander over here for, for a little bit. What you see here is a tray from a server. Over here. It looks like it's a, a, if essentially normal enterprise racks. You have these things called JBOD drawers. You pull this drawer out, and it's just full of disks, right? This is kind of similar. You pull this tray out of the rack, but it's not full of disks. It's full of servers. Each one of these servers, which sits about this big, it's about as big as a large form factor uh, SATA drive, right? is a full server with those specs that I just mentioned. And uh, they can have a um, number of disks attached to them. It varies. Um, and uh, and we've, uh, we were running a Hadoop on this uh, setup at HP, right? So um, I left before uh, our findings were conclusive, but it, it definitely does work. And they're on the trajectory for this to become an architecture for Hadoop. So now, something to keep in mind, right? Um, you see virtualization is a technology that has taken off because in some cases the current x86 commodity architecture is over provisioned for the apps that run on them. Right? So if you've got too much resources on a server, there's a couple of things that you can do. One, you could basically redesign servers and make them smaller and fit the workloads better. Or you could use virtualization and carve up the resources and, and partition the resources that way. So there's sort of two approaches going on in the market. And this is a more hardware-centric approach versus a software-centric approach. But it's pretty cool. And here's something that'll blow your mind. You can fit 270 Hadoop slaves in a single same 42U rack compared to 20. That's pretty amazing, right? So at um, an increase in storage capacity, right? So this is a pretty revolutionary architecture. Um, in the industry, it's known as system on a chip. Um, this is, a, a, this is a, a photo of Gerald Klein um, from uh, HP Houston, showing uh, he's the lab manager for this. And uh, there's a third party company, Calzada, that uh, are in Austin, Texas, which is where I live. And um, they're actually uh, partnering with HP, but they, um, they, they create these cartridges themselves. And Trevor Robinson's a member of the Apache Hadoop community, and he would love to vent to you about uh, why Hadoop community should care a little bit more about memory management, because he only has four to eight gigs that <laughs> he's dealing with, right? So um, anyways, his contact info is there. So that's my talk. Um, thank you very much for attending. I know there's free beer out there, and uh, that's your reward for sitting through this. So come chat to me. Are there any questions? Sure, go ahead. Was that a hand that you wanted to go to beer or you had a question? <laughs> yes, I'm just curious, uh, cost-wise, you factor in all those energy costs, is the atom-based uh, servers more cost-effective? They um, haven't priced them yet. Um, I, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not, so, I'm, well, I can say is I don't know, because when I lost was at HP, we hadn't priced them yet. But the power footprint is like exponentially cheaper than, um, so the steady state cost is definitely cheaper. I'm not sure what the capital, you know, the, the initial order cost is. Uh, but I believe that's part of the premise, right? Is that they're cheaper steady state and at initial expenditure. Any more questions? Well, thanks for attending, folks. I appreciate you staying here.